Hello, Internet. Yes, 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 I know, I know. I promised my bloodthirsty audience a video on the Battle of the Catalonian Fields, Battle of chalon sur marne where Attila and the Romans had a little scrap. However, due to a busy time at work and an unfortunate death in my family, which means I need to go to a funeral tomorrow, which is my usual shooting day, I simply won't have the time to get the script ready and get pictures found and everything. So instead, I figured we would do a quick little Viking FAQ. This is not meant to be sort of a BuzzFeedy 10 things you probably didn't know about Vikings, and I'm sure actually plenty of the things I'm going to talk about is fairly well known to many in my audience, but I consider them important if one really sort of needs to understand Vikings, the culture and the people that we are dealing with here, and also it's a lot of those are the questions I most often get from people who want to talk to me about it, so yeah, let's get started. A small FAQ from the Sage about Vikings. Enjoy! First of all, did Vikings have horns on their helmets, as portrayed in the picture above? And the answer is, of course, absolutely not. Everyone is aware of this, but I feel like it cannot be mentioned enough since, since it still seems to show up basically any time a Viking appears, they seem to have one goddamn helmet with huge horns on, on them. <sighs> This seems basically to have started by the opera costumes of Wagner, of all things, and wasn't probably even really populated until the comic strip Hagar the Horrible. I don't know why it has taken the um, sort of life on its own that it has, but no, Vikings never wore horns on their helmets, or at the very least did so only in a ceremonial roles. Horns on helmets in the north were a much earlier thing, kind of like back into the Bronze Age 1500 years before. Certainly had nothing to do with Vikings. If nothing else, then simply for the reason that a horned helmet is actually a fairly bad thing when it comes to fighting. And even if the Vikings had had some weird priest caste who felt like horns were a thing to have, people who actually fight for a living, so to speak, rarely, really quickly realize that horns on your protective headgear are a liability, and people who maintain liabilities in their armor tends to be outlived by people who don't and disappear. And since the Vikings were very, very good at making other people disappear rather than doing it themselves well yeah no horns fucking stop it no horns number two why did vikings grow these huge uh, flowing beards well primary reason beards are cool they're manly they sort of shows that you're a big strong guy and that was important for Vikings, who after all sort of had not just a, shall we call it a right, but almost a legal obligation to brag about their skills, manliness, and how powerful they were. However, so yeah, Vikings did have huge beards, or at least large beards, unless very young or was hit with one condition. However... Probably fairly few, or at least primarily perhaps the old uh, old Vikings or elderly Vikings, had the sort of wild growing madman beard that they are also always portrayed with. Not that they didn't exist, of course, but most Vikings actually kind of kept them fairly tidy, to be perfectly honest. Men with very large beards and very much hair were also nicknamed after it, like various kings who, you know, are famous for their beards and hair. And that was primarily because it wasn't all that natural. Most, in fact, kept their hair and beards sort of, like I said, very tidy. Braiding, the, braiding it, washing it often, they were actually known for some of the other... Uh, tribes or people they came into contact with for being somewhat sissy for constantly washing and bathing and you know braiding their hair and tying little pink ribbons into it and I'm not joking there were Vikings very much who tied little pink ribbons into their hair so again several other tribes thought they were sissies <laughs> <laughs> 
until the Vikings proved they weren't, then they didn't. But again, yeah, Vikings had huge, uh, lovely beards because it was a manly and thing to manly and wonderful thing to have. But again, it wasn't quite as wild man like as often portrayed. Next question is berserkers. Did they actually exist? And yes, berserkers existed are, and are in fact uh, well documented. They were not even all that super rare, though the fact that they are mostly, of course, attested by the sagas and legends rather than actual historical sources indicates that they were probably kind of a boogeyman, even to a certain degree to other Vikings, and were perhaps more of a, you know, idealized concept even in its time, as well as they are today, but berserkers certainly did exist. It's worth to note, however, that when I say boogeyman, I probably mean it to a certain degree, actually, because most Vikings fought in fairly disciplined shield walls, and the concept of some random maniac in a bearskin and otherwise nude running against the enemy swinging a huge axe while seems fairly manly also kind of, you know, disturb the battle tactics of most Viking armies. Berserkers were therefore mo mostly used in either, you know, combat by champion or combat by leaders or just sticking them on the enemy to break the enemy formation or morale by taking out various leaders before the berserkers themselves got wounded enough to fall down and then the rest of the viking forces could win as an army rather than an uh, as an undisciplined rabble this is something i will since i haven't gotten any other questions i might as well take it here vikings very much fought as armies yes they could do the undisciplined rabble if they must but most times Vikings were as disciplined as any other fighting force in through, throughout history. So, yeah, Berserkers did exist. Wasn't nearly as, perhaps, um, widespread as some stories lead to believe. Certainly existed, but was used probably more in single combat than in on the uh, field of battle. Next question was about Viking weapons. What kind of weaponry did the Vikings use? Well, Vikings, of course, used what we think they used. They used swords, they used spears, axes, bow and arrow, daggers, and so on. However, swords, as we most often see them with, perhaps, in uh, bes beside the traditional battle axe, were actually fairly rare, just like they were in many other places uh, at the sa this particular time. Swords were... Fairly expensive, and most Vikings were basically small farmers joining an expedition or two here and there, so their weapons had an armor even had to be somewhat cheap. Most of them probably didn't wear chainmail, except if they were of the nobility or shall we say professional fighters like in a nobleman's personal bodyguard or some of the uh, more shall we say professional standing Viking armies, though they were very small. So yeah, most Vikings were using spears to go with their shield wall and axes. Uh, because axes, again, is something that can be... Both spears and axes are something that can be adapted from farming implements and works very well with the kind of warfare that Vikings were used to. Also, axes have been a thing in the North since at least the early Bronze Age when we probably got the technology to really start casting them, they were considered sacred tools. So just the fact that you, as a small holder, would probably use an axe fairly often and thus get at least some idea of how to wield it, and the fact that it was just a thing to use in the Nordic probably means that spear and axe were the primary armament of Vikings, and especially since it worked very well with the standard Viking uh, tactics of pretending to be defeated in their shield wall, run away in a somewhat skirmish E line until the enemies broke formation to hunt them, then turn around, immediately fall the shield wall and utterly destroy the now completely undisciplined enemies. Armory-wise, hmm, 
probably not much. Almost every Viking would have a shield. You just couldn't be one without a shield. You had to protect yourself with the shield, and it had some significant religious uh, points to it as well. However, primarily, again, parts chainmail, sometimes full chainmail, a helmet, perhaps swords, shields, spears. Those were Viking weapons, and as you can imagine from various stories, they were fairly proficient with them, especially the standing professional soldiers. Viking fleets. What was a Viking fleet? Well, when we think of the Viking fleets where the longships basically fill the, fill the seas from horizon to horizon, yeah, that didn't happen very often. What was a Viking fleet? A Viking fleet, when on a normal raid, was probably one, two, possibly three ships, each between 20 and 40 men aboard, probably was basically the norm under some charismatic local leader. Larger fleets naturally existed under famous leaders and kings and the most powerful Jarls. But since most, shall we call it, intra-Nordic combat in the early Viking years at least were often settled with combat of leaders or combat of champions and so on, and since most Viking raids were basically just that, raids, plundering raids of various villages and so on, they didn't actually need that huge fleet. The largest fleet that could be mustered and probably were mustered during the uh, was during the late Viking Age, and there was a full Dan Danish full sea mobilization, where basically every village, every settlement in the realm had to produce a ship with crew to man it. Uh, this was at the very height in the Viking Age, and at the very height of the North Sea Empire, and it could produce from anywhere from around 300 to 400 sheep, ships with probably around 55 to 60,000 men aboard. This was called out exceedingly rarely. Absolutely not. Most of even the greatest Viking fleets probably had somewhere from 50 to 100 ships with, again, assorted crew aboard. Somewhere between perhaps 20 to 50, 60 men, depending on the side of... Uh, uh, size, of course, not size, size of the fleet. It is worth, however, that even so early as 845, two Viking fleets were each big enough to both basically conquer most of northern France and besiege Paris, while another of the, well, perhaps even larger, sailed up into northern Germany and conquered and burned Hamburg to the ground, while at the same time fighting off the various uh, holy imperial forces opposing them. So, yeah, larger fleets did exist, but not that often. Kings, Viking kings, there seem to have been an ungodly amount of them, often at the same time. So why so many kings? Well, primarily because king was not a protected title, so to speak. Anyone, particularly in the pre-Viking era and in the early Viking age, with a certain amount of men and ship under their control was basically a king. Fairly often people who were not kings when they were at home would be considered sea kings because they held the same sort of power over their gathered fleet as a normal king would hold on land. Towards the middle and end of the Viking era, the pre Viking various tribes and nationalities that had been in Scandinavia and the north had coalesced more or less into the uh, nations and peoples we see today of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, the, those kind of areas. And the kings of those had become kings as we know about it. But even then, most of them were really just a bit more powerful than a lot of other rulers, though their highest nobilities at the time no longer called themselves kings, but rather were jarls or earls or whatever other titles they were using. They were very much sovereign princes of their own domain, even if they did hold allegiance to the king of Denmark. However, that is basically why there were so many kings often at the same time. First, not all the realms were as united into nations as can you can be misled to believe when I use the term Danish, Norwegian and Sweden. But also basically it depends on what time we have. Because at the end of it, yeah, they were definite kings. 
before that, eh, kings was whoever basically could get enough people together to say he was a king. At least in the area where he was at any given time. Next question. Why was the Vikings, or how did they become so powerful? Well, there were several reasons. There were, of course, a religion and a culture who sort of encouraged uh, ex uh, not expansion necessarily, but, you know, going out and plundering and killing and fighting a certain kind of macho culture who glamorized the strong, powerful warrior. There were several pri reasons, but the primary reason I already sort of mentioned, the Viking fleets. Viking armies were actually fairly often defeated on land, but there's practically no record of an actual Viking fleet being defeated in ocean combat. So basically total control of the sea with all of the advantages of fast transportation and log logistics that will bring meant that the Vikings had the power that they possessed and, well gave them the position that they had. They could appear anywhere they want, go anywhere they want, attack anywhere they want, and the enemies had to respond to them. And their enemies couldn't really get back at them, because at the most, the empire who was just south could probably take control of the Jutland Peninsula for a while at least, but they would never be able to attack the other Danish Isles or Norway and Sweden because they would have no way of ferrying their armies there. And the armies that they then possessed in Jutland would be constantly raided and attacked by fresh people from the other Scandinavian heartlands. So yeah, the real secret, which isn't of course a secret, but the real source of Viking supremacy and power during the eras where they were most successful, basically the fact that they ruled the seas. And I mean really ruled the seas. They're not like the British fleet during the 19th century who ruled the seas because they were the biggest. No, ruled the seas as because they were the only one who had successful fleets in any kind of fashion. So, next question was, or is, um, what was the most important, possibly even the greatest yet unknown Viking victory, the one no one has heard of? And, whew, that's a hard call to make. There were some great battles during the conquests of Britain or during the fights over Britain or in the east, in Russia, or uh, between Vikings themselves. Some of the internal battles I could choose, perhaps, against the fighting in Russia that basically established Russia as a nation rather than a bunch of scattered tribes. Hmm. In the end, I'll put my coin on a fairly unknown battle, actually, where Harold Bluetooth with a Danish fleet came to the aid of its kinsman Richard, Duke of Normandy, the grandson of Rollo, the first duke and ancestor of William the Conqueror. Rollo was probably either the cousin or second cousin of the famous Ragnar Lothbrok and perhaps even the ruling Danish king at the time, Harek. But his grandson had was a kid because his father had died young in an ambush by a certain French Count Herluin, and now the French King Philip IV had almost succeeded in taking over the duchy and either deposing Richard or making him into his puppet by pretending to be his friend and guardian. However, certain Vikings who saw where things were going sent for help in Denmark and Harold responded. Because I love the way the language is used, I feel I can do no better to describe what actually happened during the battle than to quote the uh, chronicles of what a later messenger from the Duke told the great uh, Count Odo of Paris, the most powerful nobleman in France at the time, when he was to tell him what had happened during the battle. So, it basically goes, the messenger speaks, have you had any news on the wings of rumor? 
Odo replies no, and the messenger continues, Well, let it be known to you then as a given thing that King Harold of Darnia, on behalf of Richard, Duke of Normandy, his kinsman and my sister's son, has fought against the King of France and all his noblemen and killed 13 dukes, including Halloween, and captured the king and chased him down and imprisoned him in ruin the capital of Normandy. Odo apparently felt that the king basically had deserved what he got because he didn't really do anything to get him loose. The French king's brother-in-law, the king of Germany and uh, Holy Roman Empire, sorry, Holy Roman Emperor, apparently felt that his brother-in-law also could get himself out of that particular issue. So basically, eventually, a huge ransom was paid to the uh, Harold and to Richard, and Richard's place as Duke of Normandy was secure from uh, Philip's armies and Philip's reign in France. And yeah, the history of England, considering that William the Conqueror was one of Richard's grandchildren or great-grandchildren, would have been very much different. In fact, the whole Western European civilization would have been very different if the Normanic dukes wouldn't have been there to conquer Britain or if the French kings had put themselves back in control of their most rich and populated um, vassalage during that time. So, yeah, Harold destroying the army of Philip IV on behalf of Richard of Normandy, the most important yet unknown Viking victory. Next one is if I could sort of go over the Vikings' creation myth, its uh, origins of the universe, so to speak. And while I have sort of dealt with it in my overview of Viking mythology, and while I certainly can't do the full story here because it's very long and one day I might just do a reading of it because it is very interesting, we uh, can take a quick start. Before the creation of the world, there were basically three things. There was the homeland of elemental fire, Muspelheim. The homeland of elemental ice, Niflheim. And between them lay the gaping abyss of perfect silence and darkness known as Ginungagab, lit only to a certain degree by the billowing flames from Muspelheim. Frost from Nisselheim and flames from Muspelheim crept towards each other until they met in Genunga Gap, and here the fire melted the ice and the drops formed themselves into Emir, the first of the primal Jotons or godlike giants. Emir was a hermaphrodite and could reproduce asexually, so basically when he sweat sweated i suppose you could say more giants were born they were born there were born giants from between his uh well from his armpits and so on so yeah the first inhabitants of the universe according to north legends were basically sweat sweated into existence by the primal uh ancestor of all however as the frost continued to melt, a cow, out Humbla, emerged from it, and she nourished Umir with her milk, and she in turn were not nourished by the salt licks in the ice. Her licks slowly uncovered the people who were uh, hidden in the ice, namely Buri, who was the first of the Aesir gods. Buri then also had a son who married a woman called Bestla, uh, a daughter of one of Emir's innumerous sweated out children. The half god, half giant children of Bor and Bestla were Odin, who of course became the primary god later, and his two brothers Vili and Ve. Now, Odin and his brothers slew Emir and set about constructing the world from its corpse. They made the heavens from his massive uh, cranium and put. Uh, sparks from Muspelheim on the inside as stars. They fashioned the oceans from the amount of his blood, soil of the earth from his skins and muscles, vegetation and flowers from his hair, clouds from his brains, and, the, and of course, the uh, mountains from his bones. 
Four dwarfs were placed on each cardinal point of the compass to hold Emir's skull aloft above the earth to create the domed heavens. The gods then eventually went on to form the first humans, Ask and Embla, from two tree trunks they carved into man shape and granted life, and then built a fence around their dwelling place, Midgard, to protect them from the giants. This was, in fact, after all, the primary job of the Norse gods, to protect us from the chaos of primal uh, forces opposing us. There's a lot more, and like I say, one day I will probably just do a reading of the Nordic creation myth, because it is brilliant, and it is very uh, detailed, and it is very, very good. But yeah, humanity was created by fire and ice meeting to create a hermaphrodite who sweated out all life. Mm. And don't say Vikings didn't drink enough mead. Next point of order, we was Vikings! Was there in fact black Vikings? And yes, there probably was some, actually. Vikings were not black in the north itself, but contacts to the south definitely, especially through the uh, river system of Russia and the Byzantines, as well as certain raids that actually went down to Africa itself, definitely gave some contact with sub-Saharan uh, tribes and it is likely that some would have joined the various crews or have been taken back to the north as slaves and those slaves uh, descendants would probably have some have been freed and some of them would have joined the viking crew so yeah black uh, vikings yeah definitely However, it was certainly not either common or happened every day or anything like that. If a Viking was known as the Black, it was certainly not because he happened to be from Africa somehow. It was because he had dark hair or wore black or had a black temper or anything. So yeah, there were probably some descendants of slaves or just drifters to the north who were Vikings. During that particular time, some has even been to a certain degree attested in various chronicles, but no, we was in fact not Vikings. The black Vikings could probably have been counted on two hands during the entire four, five hundred year period of Viking raids, but certainly existed. Shield maidens, did they exist? Oh yes, they did. Very much certainly. And they were not even, uh, to a certain degree, even frowned upon or even exceptionally rare. They were, however, certainly not an everyday occurrence. Some, particularly in the sagas and legends, uh, were professional Vikings or, you know, lifelong shield maidens. But in actual recorded history, they were somewhat rare. Though, of course, shall we call them land-based shield maidens fighting in their local areas under a local lord or as a local lady would probably have been a lot more normal than the ones who went a-raiding. There might also have been some kind of... Well, we have the Valkyrie, so we know the North believed in female warriors. And there might have been some, I don't want to say orders of female warriors, but at least some perhaps female warriors dedicated themselves either to Odin or to Freya in her military aspect from time to time and become truly lifelong dedicated shield maidens, though most... Uh, shall we say, uh, shield maidens we actually know about, hell, even in the sagas, seem to have been so primarily during their wild youth and then eventually finding some husband and settling down as wife and mother. So yeah, it, it cer they certainly existed and they wasn't all that horribly rare, but they don't seem to have performed the sort of massive gender role switch as some uh, seem to have tried to make them be. And finally, navigation. How did the Vikings navigate their longships around? This was before the age of compasses and sextants and so on. How did they become so good sailors, as I mentioned earlier, that they could basically dominate their world through their sailing abilities? And 
How did they navigate? Well, they navigated as practically everyone else did at the time. Landmarks, mental charts because they remember where they had been. Animal life such as birds and whales and various uh, other creatures that they could see. Possibly even use of what is called sunstones, a kind of mineral that apparently allows you to uh, identify the position of the sun even on clouded days by looking at how various light sources reflect into it. I don't know exactly how the damn thing works. It's possible the Vikings would have used that if they know it, but it hasn't really been attested until about 200 years later, so... Maybe, but at least if the Vikings know, knew about it, they would certainly have used it. Some Vikings probably also used the very primitive fashions of sextants and compasses and so on that other primitive people seem to have developed. But generally, the Vikings' rule of the sea was honestly, in the end, just courage, sea knowledge, lots of years in developing fleets and ships while understanding weather patterns and currents on a learned and perhaps even almost natural fashion. So yeah, they were just really good at what they did, to be perfectly honest. There were no real secrets. They'd just done it for so long while everyone else has stayed on land. Well, that was it. I hope I entertained you and perhaps you even learned a thing and the people who asked the questions, thank you very much. I hope you were enlightened. Holy crap, half an hour. This is what happens every time I try to do a, you know, quick and dirty little thing that I can shoot quickly uh, without any real production going into it. It lasts for half an hour. I wanted it to be about 10 minutes. Anyway, I hope I haven't spoken too long. I hope you all like this. If you want to see more in this style, please let me know about Vikings or anything else. Again, if you have questions, hit me up on Twitter, hit me up here, hit me up wherever you can find me and ask those questions. And I'll do my best to put out these videos to answer them if people want to see it. Not that my audience exactly are world beating, but, you know, those of you who are here, I truly do appreciate and admire. So, yeah, I hope this was fun for you guys. And until next time, I have been The Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.